Hey, what's up guys? Bitcoin is wiggling near its all-time high, but it's far from over. In this video, we'll take a look at the detailed Bitcoin prediction of north of $300,000 in this cycle, then Shark Tank investor Kevin O'Leary will explain why the avalanche of money is about to flow into the space. Let's start today with the Bitcoin price action. As of the time of this recording, Bitcoin price is slightly above $63,000. Just recently we had some minor retracement after Bitcoin hit new all-time high of 66,000 bucks. Speaking about the price movement, it seems like Bitcoin is breaking upwards from this ascending triangle. Very bullish indicator. Hopefully, now $60,000 will be the support line for Bitcoin price. We are getting closer and closer till the end of this year, slightly more than 2 months left. But let's not forget that what Bitcoin is capable in a short period of time. Early in this bull market run, Bitcoin spiked from $20,000 till $60,000 in just 2 months. Back in 2017 bull market, Bitcoin spiked from $4,000 till $20,000 in just 2 months as well. Back in 2013, Bitcoin spiked from $100 till $1,000 within 2 months as well. So the moral of the story is, Bitcoin can generate most of its gains in a short period of time. And it might happen in the next 2 months. Bitcoin Fear and Greed Index currently is at 74, which resembles greed. When BC reached an all-time high, it was near 80. Maybe this could be your last chance to buy Bitcoin at a small discount. The Bitcoin hash rate power continues to make new local high, 151 million terahashes per second. An all-time high was back in May where BTC network reached 180 million terahashes per second. But soon after that when China banned Bitcoin mining, mining power dropped by more than 55% in just a matter of weeks. Now it seems like China regrets kicking out all the Bitcoin miners from its country. China is thinking about unbanning Bitcoin mining after price rise and started new research. According to Cointelegraph, Chinese National Development and Return Commission is now seeking public opinion on the inclusion of crypto mining in this list of phased out industries after seeing that the ban helped the US to become the world's dominant crypto mining nation. Chinese plans to crash the Bitcoin value appears to have backfired as crypto coin is back to its value recorded before the crypto mining ban. It looks like Chinese stance regarding the crypto mining was finally cemented with the ban imposed in May this year, after it had been going back and forth on the issue since 2019. But now they are skeptical after most of the Bitcoin hash rate power was relocated from China to the States, helping the US to become a leading hash rate provider. I believe now US has around 35% of all Bitcoin hash rate power. China is a joke. If they will make Bitcoin legal again, not many miners will come back to China since China can change their opinion at any given day and ban it again. Here is an interesting observation on this chart. This chart represents long term holder and UPL. And UPL stands for net and realist profit slash loss. And it takes into the account unspent transactions output with the lifespan of at least 155 days and serves as an indicator to assess the behavior of the long term investors. Currently, we are at this denial phase, which is represented by this green color, and it is reversing. Similar patterns we saw back in 2013 bull market, where BTC price corrected by 70%, then it exploded from $200 till $1000. That would be 5x. If in this cycle BTC would generate another 5x, it would put Bitcoin price above $300,000. But wait, there is more. Here we have another interesting chart. It represents market cap to thermal cap ratio. The thermal cap ratio can be used to predict the end of the bull market. Historically, bull markets end when the value of the thermal cap multiple goes above 0 0.00004, which is in this red zone. As we can see right now, the thermal cap ratio is more or less in the middle, which can also be a great indicator that we are currently in the middle of the bull market. In 2011 bull market, the ratio surpassed into the red zone. In 2013 and 2014, we saw the same thing. And of course, in 2017 bull market, the thermal cap ratio also surpassed above the red zone. In this bull market, we are nowhere near the red zone. I know history does not have to repeat itself, but if it rhymes, we should either come close or should pass the red zone in order to call the top of the bull market. Here is my favorite chart of the day that represents Bitcoin price from one all-time high to another. In 2011, Bitcoin reached $30, which was an all-time high in that time. Then of course, it dropped by 94% or so before correcting. 
but as soon as it reached $30 again, it gained additional 700% before another correction. It reached another all-time high of $250, then it corrected by 70% before recovering. When it reached $250 again, it gained additional 340% and surpassed $1,000. And that was the top, and soon after that, BTC went into another bear market and it crashed by 87%. Few years later, it surpassed $1,000 once again, and since then it gained additional 1,620% and reached the top in 2017 bull market of $20,000. Then it took another couple of years to surpass its previous all-time high. It happened in late 2020, when BTC gained additional 230% and reached the top of $64,000. Now, just recently, Bitcoin surpassed its previous all-time high yet again. So, what can we expect this time? Well, let's see. In 2012, we had 700% rise. In 2013, we had 340% rise. In 2017, 1,600%. And in 2021, we had 230%. Yes, we can probably find an average of those numbers, but the median is the way to go. To find median, we need to rearrange those numbers from smaller to larger. That would be 230%, 340%, 700%, and 1600%. Then, we will find an average of the middle two numbers, that is 340 plus 700 divided by 2 equals to 520%. If Bitcoin will increase by additional 520% from this current price of $63,000, then we will see approximately $390,000 per single coin in this cycle. If that happened, I do not really know. Everyone can interpret historical data differently. But I do expect at least 6 figures Bitcoin in the next few months. Now, let's take a look at this video where Shark Tank investor Kevin O'Leary explains his opinion on the launch of the first Bitcoin TF. Then he will explain what will happen next. Let's take a look. First, I want to start with the big news of the Bitcoin ETF. What's your read on the launch of the Bitcoin ETF and the impact on the market? I like it uh, as an indicator that the regulator is warming up to finally um, you know, providing guidance and regulation for the real thing. I don't like it as a product. If, if I'm going to be exposed to the price of Bitcoin, why don't I just buy Bitcoin? And so you know, the futures market is very efficient, but sometimes when prices are very volatile, not so much. And so look, it's great that it's happened. It's clearly reflected in the overall price of Bitcoin with the optimism globally that the US regulator is finally going to get behind cryptocurrencies, not just Bitcoin. And it's a first baby step. But frankly, you can buy an ETF with the real thing underlying up in Canada right now, and other countries are doing that, even with Ethereum now in Canada. So, you know, hopefully within 24 months, which is sort of my time view, we're going to have the real thing, the Bitcoin inside an ETF wrapper that allows people with equity portfolios to buy it and get price exposure to the price of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. It's not a bad thing. You can't say it's bad, but it's not the way I, I don't want to invest in it that way. And why pay the fees? Why don't you just buy Bitcoin and hold it in a decentralized wallet? And I think that's the most efficient way to do it. And so, and I look at this as a huge opportunity. I speak to those guys almost every day. They would immediately go to 1% to 3% on Bitcoin alone, just Bitcoin, let alone Ethereum or any level one, level twos on, on the chain. They haven't even thought about that. They're just thinking about Bitcoin and, and, and owning that as an asset. The amount of capital that will come into this market when the regulator approves Bitcoin as an asset or a currency or a, a security, whatever they're going to you know, regulated as is going to be unbelievable, which is why I own it. I mean, my, my premise, you know, stomaching the volatility, which we all do every 12 month cycle is the upside is behemoth. It's huge. And so, uh, you know, whether it be for me, it's an asset, it's a long-term hold. The coin I own, the coin is the coin I own. I don't trade it. I lend it, I stake it. And, you know, I get some income from that, but I'm never going to give up the coin. And, you know, I heard you guys talking about the, the ESG issue. I'm sorry, that hasn't gone away, but there have been some new initiatives in raising capital to solve for it. So before we get to the ESG stuff, with this international money, right, you, you talk about them wanting to go 1% to 3% just to Bitcoin. Maybe they would do some other stuff as well. Are we talking about just large family offices in the Middle East and Europe? Are we talking about uh, foundations, sovereign wealth funds? Like, it, it, And I'm trying to use that as a proxy for like, 
how serious uh, the most conservative investors in the world are about this versus, oh, no, this is a large family office where there's kind of one decision maker and they're going to end up making that decision based on how comfortable they are in a regulation standpoint and also a return standpoint. Yeah. Um, the, the real opportunity is not with the family offices or hedge funds that operate out of the Middle East. The real money is in the actual sovereign funds in both Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. It's billions and billions and billions of dollars. They have not allocated to crypto yet. When that happens, you'll see it reflected in the price of Bitcoin. There's no question about it. And they, they have such long-term use in, in those funds that, and the funds are so large. Remember, these countries don't operate the same way as the US domestic uh, countries do, although they're managed. Many of the people managing those Middle Eastern funds, the sovereign funds, are actually Western educated managers. And so they generally abide by discipline and principles of, of uh, you know, uh, risk diversification. So they may have a mandate, for example, that no stock can represent more than 5% of the fund or no sector more than 20%. Those are diversification mandates that are used all around the world, and they do that there too. But when you're dealing with a multi-billion dollar mandate, and some of these are, they're the largest pools of capital in the world. A 1% allocation is a tremendous amount of money. Kevin, I got two questions for you and then we'll let you go. First is when you think about uh, those regulators coming in and giving the thumbs up, kind of uh, saying, all right, everyone go, would you go to 20% or would you do more in your portfolio in terms of full exposure to the industry? Could you see yourself going to 50 plus percent given that you're 50 plus percent in US dollar uh, kind of assets and, and cash? Well, you know, it's a good question, Paul. Um, and we just had that discussion uh, on Monday with our own team. Uh, here's, uh, here's what I think we're going to do. We're going to go to 7% on crypto itself by December. But I've also started to take some pretty big positions in public miners right now that are checking the box on ESG. And so I guess you could argue that if you included that in what we'll call the crypto weighting, if you want to call that an asset class. And the reason I'm doing it that way is... I really can't go past a 20% in any one sector. If you call, I really believe that, that crypto is the 12th sector of the S&P. We don't know it yet. It hasn't been designated that, but it's coming in the, in the years ahead. We have 11 sectors now, including real estate. Crypto is going to be number 12, primarily driven by decentralized finance. It's so disruptive, so powerful, so productive. It'll get there. So I want to have more exposure during that transition. Um, and I guess the way to do that and, and, and keep my own compliance department on board, my own auditor on board is to simply buy the securities of those compliant miners that are trading with the volatility of Bitcoin's pricing. Kevin is glad that Bitcoin futures have happened, but he's not a fan of the product. I agree, if he wants to get exposure to Bitcoin price, just buy Bitcoin itself. He also continued to say that when regulators will fully embrace Bitcoin, we will see enormous amount of money flowing into the space. I think it's already getting started. The approval of the first future Bitcoin TF is the first step for hyper Bitcoinization. Let me know what you guys think about this recent Bitcoin TF. Is it good or bad in the long term? Leave your thoughts in the comment section below, smash that like button and subscribe for more videos.